last session, I'm going to actually put two of them together. We're going to talk about winnowing and gathering up into the bin, okay, to where grain is useful. <laughs> that's what we want to be. We want to be useful. Uh, so that's where we're going to go, okay? Uh, winnowing. This is where you clean the grain. The process of separating the kernels of threshed grain, such as wheat or barley, from the chaff with a current of air. All right? In Christian terms, it's the process of sanctification. The process of sanctification. So many times Christians are left sucking air when somebody comes up and they pray a prayer of salvation, but they go out and have a cigarette. See, God doesn't change you all at one time, does it? Or they start coming to church and they, and they still go to the bar. And people are like, oh, I can't believe it. Like, just, just give it time. Give it time. Remember, keep them in the machine. Keep them in the machine. So here you can see what this whole process looks like, okay? This is the part after it goes through that threshing cylinder that we showed you. The grain comes and it falls on here and it goes through this process, all right? Winnowing. Here it is. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn. Look at this. Burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. We want to avoid being with the chaff. Amen? That's the key. And that's what this does. This is the winnowing fork. It keeps everything flying. This thing moves like you can't believe the speed of it, how fast it goes, and the wind. You go behind a machine, you're going to get dirt in your eyes because the wind is just blowing through this thing. If that fan stops, you're done. It's all over. It won't work without the air, okay? Now, winnowing is not, and I think a lot of churches don't get this, all right? At the at that time, this people and Jerusalem will be told, a scorching wind from the barren heights in the desert blows toward my people, but not to winnow or cleanse. A wind too strong for that comes from me. Now I pronounce judgment against them. The sanctification process, the winnowing process, it's not to wipe anybody out or to wipe things out. It's not to ruin people. It's not to damn them or to condemn them it's the process of sanctification where you become more like christ this is why we can do damage to people when we try to make them do something too fast <laughs> there are people who have left churches and they won't come back again because they've been hurt so badly in church that they're like that, that hurts so bad i don't want to go back again they didn't love me. They were trying to root things out of my life, you know. And we have to allow the process to go on. So winnowing is not a scorching wind, you see, that wipes people out. It's, it's something that will cleanse and it will help somebody. This is what winnowing is. Hebrews chapter 12, all right. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Next verse is key. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Like I told you, this machine never slows down. It's always moving. It's always shaken. Removes what can be shaken, that is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. How many times do we hear people say, if I had only known what was important in my life when I was young? If I had only known. And God wants to remove the things that can be shaken so that we see the eternal things in life that are so important. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Suddenly there came from heaven 
or the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. One sat upon each of them. Isn't it interesting, on the day of Pentecost, God sent wind and fire? He sent wind to clear away the chaff and fire to burn up the chaff. But what he wanted was a cleansed life. He wanted the sin and the dust and the garbage to be blown away from us so that we can live a holy life for God. That's what this process does. That's why it says Jesus winnowing forks in his hand and he'll clear his threshing floor. That's why threshing floors were put up on a hill where there would always be a breeze because they would take a fork and they would throw the straw up and the grain would fall down and it would blow all the dust and the dirt away. And whichever way the wind was blowing, there'd be a pile of chaff over there that they'd pick up at the end of the night and they'd burn it. It's so important that you have that wind. It's why a church can't survive without the Holy Spirit. If you ignore the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit, you're done. Nobody can change. The Spirit of God keeps that moving. A life winnowed. I love this. This is Jesus speaking. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. There are a couple elements in this you have to see. He says Satan wants to sift you like wheat. Isn't that interesting? Again, if you don't know the threshing and the winnowing process, you're going, what are you talking about? But Satan wanted to shake him, and he says, I've prayed for you, and here's the key ingredient in the text, faith, that your faith will not fail you. We are saved by grace through faith, aren't we? That's the, way, that's the way it happens. And here you see it, and Peter had a winnowed life, didn't he? <laughs> oh, my goodness, he had a winnowed life. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, if you can picture this, the grain comes through these augers and it falls down on this and they're shaking and there's wind blowing. If the grain, if a kernel of grain is too light, you know what'll happen? It'll blow right out the back of the machine. So you know what the kernel of grain has to have? It has to have substance. It has to be dense enough it has to have enough density that it will fall through these are like fingers you see their fingers like this and the grain goes over the top and it's bouncing and the wind's blowing and you have to set these you set these just the right distance so the kernels will fall down through it but all the stalk and the dirt will blow out and it'll be shaken through the machine my dad was meticulous about this. If you had one little corn stalk in the bin when you were done, my dad was upset because they were going to dock you. When you sold that corn, they would dock you for foreign material, FM, foreign matter in your corn. That's what they would say. See, Jesus wants a holy life, but get it again, the faith. It is the substance in a human life, when sin and the world shakes you and throws you up in the air, if you have no faith, you'll blow right out the back of the machine and you turn out with the chaff. But if you have faith, you know what happens? You keep falling down on this and eventually you fall through and you get gathered in to Jesus' barn. Isn't that our goal? Without faith, it's impossible to please God because you won't be in, in his, his realm anymore. You're going to go out with the chaff. And it amazes me. People can say, well, you know, Scripture was written so long, but isn't it interesting? It's the substance. And in order for a kernel of grain to stay in a machine, it has to have enough substance. If my dad found a kernel of grain behind a combine, he would pick it up and he would go, yeah, that's a real, it, it, that's a light little kernel. We didn't want it anyway. It would have ruined our test weight. That's what he would say. Because if it was too light, they'd dock you for that too. Faith is the substance. It's so important. Ephesians chapter 4. 
then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. If you have faith, every time something in this world tosses you up, you'll fall back down and you'll keep falling on the threshing floor until Jesus gathers you in. If you don't have faith, you're going to go right out the back. People without faith, they leave, don't they? (laughs) They go, I don't want to hear this anymore. I'm gone. People often say this to me. They say, did you know that so-and-so over there is doing this in church? You know, what are you going to do about that, Pastor? (laughs) It's the, you know, church police. They're like, "Ah, I saw them. Now, I'm not gossiping, but just as a matter of prayer, I heard they were doing this. And you know what I tell them all the time? They get upset with me because I go, no, I'm not going to talk to them. I go, what are you going to do? I said, I'm just going to keep preaching the word for three or four weeks. And after they hear the word over and over, eventually they'll change or they'll leave one or the other. Because the word of God makes such a difference. Because without that faith, you're going to just blow out. You're going to keep moving away. All right? Winnowing. The process of separating the kernels of threshed grains, such as wheat or barley, from chaff with a current of air. I want to make this point, and I don't want you guys to miss this. This is after a person has given their heart to the Lord. They're threshed. They've repented of their sin. They've come into the kingdom of God, but there are still, there's still dust, and there's dirt, and there's still sin trying to conquer us. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit and the shaking and our faith that will cleanse us and brings us to a place where we've been sanctified. I mean, I, I have to just tell you, after I gave my heart to the Lord, I used to play softball on a 16-inch softball league with all my friends. And, and we would, when we were done playing, we'd just sit on the tailgate of our pickup trucks and start drinking beer. And one, one day, my two little daughters sat in the truck with me And all of a sudden, my daughter, Sheila, said, hey, Daddy, that's your second beer. Yeah? Eventually, I decided, I can't do this anymore. See, my daughter was saying, hey, Dad, I'm a little bit worried about you. (laughs) You okay to drive home, Dad? You know, she didn't know enough to say that yet. But you see how the process began to work. And the day came when God just said to me, he, he just said to me, we were at a wedding. My wife and I were at a wedding. God said, you're not going to drink anymore. I was like, okay. He just said, you're going to stop drinking now because I don't want people to see you drinking. You're going to represent me in this way. And I said, okay. That's that process. That's that winnowing process. It took years to happen. But it happens. And God cares that much about each and every one of us. When the winnowing takes place, then you get gathered up. You see, our goal is to become a kernel of grain in God's barn. Isn't that what it says? It says he will gather his grain into the barn. And and that gathering is to bring or come together, to harvest or pick, to conclude, to sum up. It's to where you come up here and you're in the grain. Um, When I drive by these machines in the fall now, I love it, man, when I go by them in the grain, when their hopper's almost full. And some guys, they'll just keep running, and you'll see it kind of trickling over the top, you know. They're just filled up. It's just so awesome to me. And that's the way I believe God wants to harvest souls. I believe he wants to harvest the soul, okay? Remember again now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it won't work. Without substance in a kernel of grain, you can't stay in the machine. I hope you're ready for this now. Accordingly, hope is the anchor. You have faith and it gives you hope. Hope is the anchor. Listen to the next texts that are coming in Hebrews chapter 6. Accordingly, God also, in his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt that those who were to inherit the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan, intervened or mediated with an oath. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled to him for refuge might have mighty 
indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. Now we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. I want to stop there for a minute. Think about being in this machine and it taking substance to get to the place where you're going to get gathered into Jesus' barn. And then Hebrews uses this word, anchor. <laughs> you put that kind of substance into this thing and you're going to make it into God's barn because you won't be blown off the threshing floor. Does that make sense? It's just so important. We don't understand how important our faith and the hope we have in Christ really is. It says it cannot slip, it cannot break down under whoever steps on it, upon it a hope that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Where Jesus has entered in for us in advance, a forerunner, having become a high priest forever after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. If you put your hope in Christ, he becomes the anchor of your soul and nothing can get me off God's threshing floor. I tell people, you can tie a rope on me, hook me to your horse, and drag me through the creek bed, and you can't get Jesus out of my heart. Because he's the anchor of my soul. My hope is literally in him. It's not in anything else or anyone else. And when you come to this machine, this is what you're looking at. You have to have the substance. Now look at this. When Jesus speaks about gathering and the process of how this happens, all right, from Luke 18, Listen to what this says. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you know the beginning of this story, the Pharisee was there bragging to God. Do you remember this? Lord, I fast so many times, I bring my tithe, I do this, you know. Oh, I'm such a wonderful person. But it says that this sinner over here was beating his breast, saying, Lord, I don't even deserve to be in your house. Hear what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, this man, the guy that was repenting, that was on his knees before God, it says he went home justified before God. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right? Now, you need to know this, where you're heading in this machine. In order to get into the bin, you have to get down to the bottom. It's the only way that you can make it, all right? You see this? Right here, here's the tire. This is probably a foot to two feet off the ground. Do you know that? If it's three or four feet, that's as, as low as it, as it is, you know. It's right there. And in order for a kernel of grain to go up into the bin to get gathered into Jesus' barn, you have to make it right here. You have to be humbled. That's why Jesus says, if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. But if you exalt yourself, you'll have to be humbled. And this grain, which started way up here in the threshing, has been going down, 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 and it comes all the way to here before it gets gathered up and it gets put up in to the bin. It can't happen unless you're humbled. It, it's something that's so foreign to us. <laughs> we want to keep climbing. And Jesus says, if you let go and put your faith in me and you humble yourself and you get down here, I'm taking you up from there. Now look at what Jesus saves us from. Jeremiah says this, what the Lord declares, the dead bodies of men will lie, look at this, like refuse on the open field, like cut grain behind the reaper with no one to gather them. That's such a sad note to me. You know what they become? Fertilizer. That's all it is. You wind up being manure for next year's crop. And that's what he saves us from. Jeremiah 9, 23, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast in, of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. 
But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and he knows me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Did you notice that we're not supposed to boast in our wisdom or our strength or our riches? Because <laughs> if you go back to the winnowing part, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The smartest guy in the world finds out there's somebody who knows more than him. The strongest person in the world finds out there's somebody stronger. And the richest man, well, riches, they do get wings and fly away. That's what Proverbs says. And that's not where it at is that it's at. Jesus saves us from all of that. Now Jesus gathers into his barn. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you have it? The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you allow the winnowing process It'll get you to a place where all the things in this world that are temporal will be put where they belong. (laughs) And peace with God becomes everything. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and he's approved by men. We talk about working for an audience of one. And when the Spirit of God gets a hold of you and begins to work on you, you find out that if it's okay with God, then it's okay with you. (laughs) And then you're going to find out that sometimes you're not going to worry about what everybody else says as long as you know it's God's will. Your faith is going to keep you coming back down on that threshing floor. Jesus gathers into his barn. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is your standing. It's like your legal standing with Christ. Do you know that? Right now, today, if you've you've confessed Jesus as your Lord, if you've asked him to forgive you for your sins, you are seated with him in the heavenly realms. The best way I've had it explained to me is if you're a citizen of the United States of America, how many times do you go look at your papers to see if you're really a citizen and you look at a document? Nobody does that. For married people, how many married people go and they look at their marriage certificate every day just to make sure they're still married? People don't do that. We laugh about it. We go, well, that, that would be silly. But yet, over and over, people say, well, well, I prayed the prayer, and I, and I love Christ with all my heart, but oh, am I still in? The answer is yes. You see this? You are seated with him in the heavenly realm. I'm here to tell you it doesn't always feel that way. But the fact is, he saved you and he's gathered you in to his barn. And here's a concept uh, that you really need already, but not yet. A man by the name of Dr. Gordon Fee taught this to me, and I just, I thank him for teaching it. You see, I'm already a child of Christ. I have a ticket in heaven. Do you know that? I have a room in heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. He's got a spot for me in heaven. But I'm not there yet. I'm like, you know, so many days, I'm like, Lord, you can take me like now. And he says, you're already there. It's just, it's just not yet. It's not your time yet. But here we are still citizens of heaven. Paul says, my citizenship's in heaven. This is a temporary place where I live. And he said, I'm torn between the two. He said, I want to go to be with Jesus But he said, while I'm here, it's good for you guys. I I love that. He says, while I'm here, it's good for you because I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to keep pointing you to Jesus. If I highlight one thing, it's that process of sanctification. We're all in it. I'm in it. Everybody here is in it. But that machine is, it's shaking. The wind is blowing. Uh, The dust is being taken off of us. We should be drawn closer and closer. People that come to church, that hear the word of God constantly, should draw closer and closer to God every day. Every day. I'm going to end with these verses from Jeremiah. You'll see where they're from. 
Some of the saddest words, I think, are in Scripture. The harvest has passed. The summer has ended. And we are not saved. It's such a sad point to me. Text is Jeremiah 8.20, the weeping prophet. And there are so many churches today that are missing parts of what I've shown you. They, they don't go out and evangelize and they don't invite people to come in and people never get in where they can hear the word of God so they can go through the threshing process. And therefore their sin holds them back and they can't go into the kingdom of God because they don't even know they're sinning because they're not hearing the word of God and there's no threshing floor for them to be harvested in. And there are some that never feel the wind of the Holy Spirit speaking to them, saying, give that up, man. It's going to hurt you. Daddy, that's your second beer. They never hear the voice of the Spirit saying, I think you should stop doing this now. They never get that power. They never see that that sin needs to go up in flames so that they can be gathered in. It's my prayer today that everybody that goes through this learns a couple things. Number one, find out where you're at with God. Make sure that that last night line is not you. That the harvest has passed, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. The day's coming when the trumpet's going to blow, and it's going to be too late. So make sure first of your own salvation. Know that you've ask Jesus for forgiveness and you've recognized him for who he is and you've given him permission to bring his word into your life and take the sin out of your life at his pace not yours not mine but at his pace and then go through that winnowing process where the wind of the Holy Spirit begins to convict you and it changes you and you begin to live a holy life and you wake up in the morning in righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit now that's an exciting life The other thing I want to encourage you to do with all my heart is invite people to come to church. Just invite them. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Give them a ride. Bring them in. Sit with them. Get them in. Because then the threshing process can begin. And the winnowing process can begin. I'm here to tell you, those people you invite to church, they come in and they get into God's machine. They get into God's harvest. They are going to thank you for the church. Because they escaped the fire of being, being with the chaff. Because they Father, I ask you to take your word and let it accomplish what you sent it to do in us today. Lord, I lift up your church. That word, your church would be alive with a live threshing floor, with, with heads that are bringing in the grain. And that, Lord, there would be the wailing process and that we would be gathered into your 